Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tinkser. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders to create heart-centered and profitable businesses from the inside out, the kind to both employees and customers love and support. Thanks to Biz Simply for sponsoring this episode as our show partner. And Biz Simply is the all-in-one HR, workforce management, road and operations software designed and built by hospitality experts to make every shift run like clockwork. And we join forces to help the industry to find new ways to become even more innovative in how we lead our people, how we operate, to how we grow our businesses, to how we serve our customers. Together, we want to share strategies and tools that can make the industry thrive long-term, not just survive. There are things today, get on a bike rather than in your car, walk rather than take a tube, turn a light off when you leave the room. I mean, there are obviously tiny, tiny things that if we all did every day would make a big difference. The issue, I think, and why a lot of people don't do them, is it's not an obvious change. So you go, well, if I don't turn the light off, no one else turn the light off. What difference, what impact am I making? So I think that's an education part, and that's part of what this podcast is about and getting that message out there, making people think about it. And if we can make people take responsibility in a very small way for all the tiny little bits and pieces. This is Giles Fuchs. He's the founder and CEO of Office Space in Town, hotel owner of Birch Island Hotel, and the founder of Gunner's Cocktails. This conversation was recorded in one of Giles' own podcast studios in London. Yes, he has multiple studios. And this was also the first time I ever been invited by a guest to have their own podcast studios. I actually wanted Giles to come on the show because of his great entrepreneurial accomplishments and to get him share how he's taking his business through a transformation to make sure they're making a positive dent in the world. We will in this conversation hear about Giles' incredible entrepreneurial journey and how he came to buy a hotel and how he now is also trying to find ways to ensure that we can change the world positively through business. We will also dive into how you build a great place for people to work, the challenges ahead for businesses, and he shares a lot of great advice on how you can get started building a business as a force for good. Before you tune in, please sign up for a weekly newsletter, Maverick Talk, which is packed with more Maverick insights, strategies, and tools. Find the link in the show notes or visit hospitalitymavericks.com. Now, grab a cold drink and enjoy. Today, I have traveled up to London uh, and have been invited into uh, a podcast studio of the, the guests, actually. That's very unusual. That's the first time I heard a guest had a podcast studio. We'll come back to that. But what's really interesting is that Giles is on the show today. He's walking behind the banner of Net Zero Hospitality. And he's really trying hard to convert from the old paradigm to a new paradigm where you know people, society, and planet is put first through his own businesses. And we'll come back to that in a moment. But first of all, welcome to the show. Hello, Michael. It's lovely to be here. Well, lovely to be in my own <laughs> podcast studio. Uh, who would have thought that? So, uh, easy for you as well. You don't have to bring any equipment with you. No, no, that's no, no, that's like no heavy suitcases but, uh, when I was traveling up here today. So that was that was great. Um, and also that, uh, and thank you for inviting me in here in your, in your lovely one of your businesses. And we're going to, I think we need to dive into that because people probably think, you know, who's Giles, what he's up to, and why Michael traveled to London to visit him in his podcast studio. So tell us a bit about like your story, the milestones, but also how you became an entrepreneur and launched not just one but a number of businesses. The uh, story is probably very complicated, but it started around the kitchen table when I was about six, and my father was an entrepreneur, like yours. Mm. And uh, all we heard was boardroom talk at the kitchen table and at the lunch table and at the dinner table. So there was probably no help for me. At some point, I was going to be an entrepreneur. And as it happened, I set up my first business when I was 21. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And never been employed since. Yeah. I had a flirtation with employment for about two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Not a happy happenstance for them or me. Yeah. 
So you stayed in the lane. So I did. I did. But in terms of why we're in this uh, podcast room, uh, which is um, the first time I've used it, would you believe? Um, we have one in each of our buildings. Is um, uh, the, business, the main business I run is a serviced office business. We own properties in London and we run them as a hotel of offices is yeah. the best way to describe it, uh, offering every service from bedrooms to offices to meeting rooms to uh, kitchens to nail bars in our buildings. Yeah. So that's where it all started um, uh, most recently. Um, in 20, 2009, I set up this business with my sister. My mother had founded the industry in, uh, two, in 1979 in Northampton Town Centre. So um, we ran this, we grew this, and uh, we're going to get to the hospitality bit quickly, if that's all right. Uh, some years ago, 2018, as it happened, an acquaintance of mine came to me for a coffee and asked what I was doing, and I explained him. And uh, he told me very grandly that he was buying a hotel down in Devon. In fact, he was buying an island, and on this island was an hotel and a pub and a beach hut where Agatha Christie had written novels. The 27-acre island just off the coast of Devon in the South Hams. I was impressed, as I can tell you are, just listening to the story. And he showed me a picture of said island. And I went, well, that is amazing. You can buy an island. And he said, well, you can't buy an island, Charles, because I'm buying the island. Anyway, I said, well, good luck with that. And we shook hands and Auf Wiedersehen. A week later, and I look back now and I think perhaps he was reeling me in. <laughs> and he phoned me up to Giles. I was wondering whether you'd be interested in investing in the island as all my funding has fallen out of bed. In a flash... I said, I'll buy it. Mm. I mean, I'd never mm. heard of the island. To my shame, I hadn't heard of it because it's a very famous island. We ought to name it. It's called Burr Island. Yeah. It's very famous, very iconic, built in 1929. And it's Art Deco through and through. It has the largest collection of Art Deco, antiques and artefacts in the country, I'm told. Um, anyway, so I said yes, having not seen it. I thought I'd better see it. So myself, my girlfriend, my sister and a friend of hers went down and we mystery shopped it. And we thought, we could really do something with this. We could bring our culture, we could bring our ethos, we can bring our marketing and our PR, and we can make this into something very special. It was running about 50% occupied uh, through the year at that point. And we bought it. Mm -hmm. We bought it, which was a bizarre thing. I'm um, not a hotelier, but I am a businessman. We've established that. And our offices are really hotel offices. So it was property-based with hospitality, which I know you have some experience of in your family. Um, and that was a, a happy coming together. So we bought the island and we set to. We set to refurbishing it um, and um, stopping it leaking energy all over the place as much as we possibly could. We tried to make it as efficient as possible. We're on that journey. We've got a long, long way to go. And we'll come into more detail of that's all right, Michael, about uh, our plans uh, for the future. But um, it has... Uh, a photo uh, electric um, field. No, I don't mean that. I mean a photo cell field for creating electricity. About 7% of our electricity is self-generated on the island, which is just as well because we have limited electricity coming mm. under the beach uh, from the grid. Um, and um, we, we try and keep, if we talk about carbon footprint, footprint, which is a good place to jump in on that, we try and keep our staff local, now, there's two reasons for that. One is we're on an island. There's a tide that comes in and out twice a day. Getting on and off is difficult, so we want them to be close. That reduces their travel footprint um, de facto. Um, we also try and buy all our produce within a 10-mile uh, radius. Um, that's more challenging, of course. Mm. Um, but we have the sea all around us, so we, we do buy local fish and crustaceans and we try and where we can use local farmers you came from one business you bought the business almost by accident or by your gut said you needed to get that business you saw the potential you jumped into another area of hospitality yeah and within that you you started this you know what you discussed and we had talked about a couple of times is that you have this you know big, really you know big vision mission and also purpose that actually you want to make this green movement or net zero in hospitality can you talk a bit about that you yeah. talked a bit about the, how you get seven percent of your electricity you want to expand that net 
on the island. But what else are you doing? You know, because it's an old building and mm-hmm. and it's uh, you know it's in the outskirts mm-hmm. of the the UK, you can say, and that probably brings a lot of other challenges with it when you want to go green. I like outskirts of the UK. Mm-hmm. That's not mm-hmm. a phrase I've heard before, but I love it. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, just pure grid electricity, all uh, the electricity we use in our buildings in London is net zero. Hmm. So that's a good start. In terms of making an Art Deco listed building on an island uh, in any way efficient, you're kind of losing. <laughs> you're losing that battle from day one. But in terms of what we can do, in terms of the... We're building several things. We're building some more suites. Well, we have planning permission in to build some more suites. And more importantly, some more staff accommodation. Staff accommodation, which we can make very efficient. And also we can make it world leading. The best staff accommodation in the UK. And we'll come to that later if we may, because Mm. hospitality and staff is a big issue currently. Mm. Um, But uh, we uh, are looking um, at all sorts of ways to reduce our use of electricity. And we had Professor Doug King, who is a preeminent professor in sustainability, uh, and I had a fascinating conversation with him about everything from electricity uh, uh, production to quantum physics. So he, he's a, an enormously um, clever, um, uh, well-versed uh, person. So we had a sustainability report done for the island. What can we do and what can't we do? And the disappointing truth was this. We looked at wave motion. So we have a chap called uh, uh, Rod uh, Little on the island who is actually designed a stream generator, sea stream generator. And so we looked at whether we could use something like this. Unfortunately, where we are, we can't. We looked at uh, using wave motion, so the fetch of the sea, the up and the down, but there wasn't enough up and down to create enough electricity, it would create of 0.04 of our uh, electricity. We looked uh, at uh, heat pumps, uh, which we can do, of course. And uh, we'll we'll do that in our plans, and more photoelectric cells. We're going to put more on the roof, or we, I should say, we're going to. We we have planning permission in to put more on our roof to create more of our electricity on the island, and we looked. Uh, and Professor uh, King said the one thing you could do that would create enough energy for the whole island and the whole village opposite would be a wind turbine on the top of the island. However, mm-hmm. I don't think the planning officers are currently ready to allow us to put a wind turbine on top of the island. I did say, what about behind the island where they can't see it, in the sea? Because you see them in the sea all the time, don't you? And he said, because of how it works, they'd have to be a mile out, uh, be a shipping issue, <laughs> and vastly expensive, as you can might imagine, planting yeah. those on the seabed a mile out. So we can't have a turbine at the moment, but um, given that the country's Electricity policy is appears at the moment flawed. Who knows where that might go in 10 years' time when the lights go out. Um, so the end result, when you look at all that, obviously more photoelectric cells, heat pumps, yes. Keep your staff local, yes. Keep your produce, uh, produce local, yes. Um, it ends up that the biggest impact, that something we can all do, is pressurise the government to make green energy. Because it's going to come through the grid. And whatever we do, tinkering around the edges, frankly, it'll be nothing compared to what the government's strategy is. So what are you saying here? You're saying that it's it's, it's all good that we want to do the, the right thing, but it might not change anything if the policies, the strategies for government and the infrastructure are really put in place and taken to the next level? Well, I think that conversation, you know, the COP26 latest one, and all those conversations, um, the Paris Accord and all that, uh, is has start, is obviously started. I mean, 26, it's 26, right? Mm. So, I mean, mm. 26 of them. Um, it started. The question is how quickly we move. How quickly do we want to move? And there is a cost to us. There is a cost to us both ways. The cost if we don't do it, mm. and that is hotter and hotter weather and as a cost if we don't do it um, because uh, fuel as we know uh, carbon fuel is going up uh, and there will be a financial cost so either way we need to take control of this the wind has got to be up there um, some movement towards uh, the use of hydrogen if we can I know it's very early days but some movement forward has happened and that is obviously the cleanest of all energies um, the biggest ball of energy in our in our universe, 
or sorry, I should say, our galaxy, the sun, uh, needs to be utilised more effectively. Um, and actually, in a, in, a, in a minute, we could power the whole world if we wanted to, if only we knew how to gather that power. Um, in terms of um, the island, which is what we're talking about, we, uh, we can do all the things that we should do. So we can turn the lights out, um, we can buy stuff locally, all the stuff I've talked about. But in terms of the big change, it's us, it's you doing this podcast, it's me coming to talk to this podcast, it's us pressurising the people who make decisions and the people who haven't yet thought about it, I'll come to that in a minute, and making them think about how we can move thought things forward more quickly. So what we need to be doing is giving the average person on the street something they can do that is not an imposition on their life and not a cost to their life and immediate to make that change. So I have some thoughts on that, which we might come to later. But if we can find stuff that isn't an imposition, isn't a cost, and is something they want to do, we can make a big change very, very quickly. Yeah, and I guess, as you are saying, awareness is the first step. And what you I hear you saying as well, which made me a bit scared, is that maybe there's some people that's not aware about how fast we need to move or what needs to really happen to ensure the future. I think aware and capable of doing something about it are different. Mm. I think that there probably, I'm sure there are people who are aware uh, or aren't aware, I beg your pardon, and I'm sure there are people who have heard it but don't believe it, mm. and uh, there are people who don't care. So there, there are, I'm going to say a limited number of those. If I'm going to guess, I'd say seven out of ten people on the street know about it, would like to do something about it, as long as I know, I keep repeating myself, that isn't an imposition, isn't a cost, and something they can do easily. Yeah, and that's super interesting because that thing about there's actually people that knows, but they don't know how yes. to change it. What yes. can I do? Yes. You know, what can I do in my day to day life? That's yes. that's already pressurized and it's something with an extra cost, and especially in, in the world we live in right now with huge inflation and other surprises might on around the corner, everybody is nervous. So so what what is your thought about that? How do we make it easy then for for, for people to make that decision? Besides you are now building a place where people can come and visit and when they do that visit they are definitely contributing to a positive direction yeah although they've driven there mm. <laughs> i'm gonna so i've talked about this only very to very close friends and um i should be told off for mentioning it no doubt as i always am but i am going to mention it i think uh for years we've all been on airplanes Mm -hmm. And as we fly in at night to Heathrow or Gatwick or Paris or New York, doesn't matter, or when we see pictures of the Earth from space, what we see is a, a world that's lit up. Now, I've asked someone to go away and try and do some figures on how much electricity we are using, how many power stations could close if, and of course I understand this won't happen, all those lights every night were turned off. How much electricity is that light using? I mean, intuitively, it's a lot of light, isn't it? Mm. And therefore, it's a lot of energy. We're lighting up space. So it's not realistic to think we can turn all the lights off all the time. No doubt there are uh, safety issues, health issues uh, that we need to be aware of. But once we understand what the impact of having those lights on is, then we can talk about how we might turn some of them off which was the phrase that i coined which was turn the lights off i think it's been said before mm. but so what can we do how many of those lights can we turn off and how we can we control that light i mean just to give you a few uh, just a silly idea so you're, you're traveling down the motorway and there are lights and you're traveling down the same motorway there are no lights why do you need lights there and you don't need lights there they seem to me perfectly safe in both uh, in both environments with the lights on with the lights off i've got headlights it's night time. There aren't many cars on the road anyway. Um, there's generally some sort of celestial light going on the moon or something. But do we need those motorway lights, for instance? And if we do need those motorway lights, because at the junctions they often have them, do we need that? Could we have them on PIR? Could we have it as you driving up to it? They turn on for 30 seconds as you drive past it or come off. Um, I'm not going to give you the whole, uh, you know, uh, nine yards at this point but you can see very quickly and, and hopefully the listeners can start thinking about ideas that they 
could put forward that would help us help the government because that's or the local government maybe or uh, uh, traffic uh, come up with some things that uh, would allow us to turn some of those lights off, if not all of those lights off, not all of those lights, some of those lights. But that, that's a and that's again, you know, it's, it's typical when the media entrepreneur is thinking about, you know, how can you do something radical different than people just take for normal now, and how you can change the behavior. So actually, and it doesn't even sound nuts in my world. It sounds like, of course, it's obvious. Why? It's obvious, isn't it? And if we could save significant energy on the grid. In, in principle, it was interesting. You talk about, you know, coming back to the hotel and you talked about, you know, you, you got that hotel and you're trying to make it green. And then you mentioned yourself, yeah, people have to drive there still. So, <laughs> so we are creating some footprint. But but tell us a bit more about why this hotel is so unique, because I, I haven't been there myself, but I looked it up and thought, wow, this is like, you know, you mentioned the Art Deco, like it's, it's, it looks like a very beautiful place. If I might, Michael, just yeah. before I go into that, which I will because it's my favourite subject, I just want to say that we want our freedom. We want the right to drive our car mm. somewhere to have a holiday. We don't want to end up in a life that isn't worth living. So no. I just want to put that out there. This is not mm. about ruining our lives. This is about changing our lives uh, and not impacting our happiness or enjoyment of it. Yeah, but coming to the car as well, because I was listening or reading a book um, uh, earlier this year. It's called uh, Scale Up, where the John Dora talks about the climate change and how we can actually scale up climate solution. And he talks about exactly about the grid needs to be fixed. And if the grid is not fixed for the future, you can't get electric cars. And electric cars, technology will be there. Yeah. Apparently, they have invested a lot into electric car innovation and it will get there especially uh, with what's happening right now so we're going to take our car but it might not be a carbon burning car yeah so, so we can all be happy that we're going to go on holiday we enjoy ourselves uh, but it might not be electric if i'm just gonna yeah, yeah but, there. i mean it, the electric car might be the vhs sorry the betamax or yeah. videos <laughs> yeah um but if we go to the hotel so the hotel um is uh, the first hotel was only a seven bedroom wooden shack built by a chap called george chergwin who was a musical artist and comedian in 1880 london and he built himself a little hotel down there and uh, guests came he sold the island uh, in the 1920s to a chap called uh, archie nettlefold Nettlefold is guest key Nettlefold, who are a, a large engineering company that's still around. And he was the film producing son of um, Mr. Nettlefold Sr. And he made films and he escaped London and built himself a house in 1929. Very modern, very of concrete, of all the modern, modern substances. And his mates, including Noel Coward et al., arrived and holidayed in his house but they liked it so much they didn't leave so he started charging them and it became a hotel mm. and in 1934 he built another wing and that was when it uh, became the place to go on holiday uh, on the south coast uh, of england and it's it's retained although it's had its ups and its downs um uh, in terms of its economic success it has often been, it has been the place where celebrities uh, and the party goers want to go. The Beatles have been there uh, when they were playing in Plymouth. Uh, Churchill and Eisenhower met there during the war. Um, uh, Edward and Mrs. Simpson carried on their nefarious affair there. Uh, Montgomery is there. Um, the list is endless of the people who we've all heard of in the 30s going and meeting and partying. Uh, and that And that lovely... Uh, history of slight decadence uh, and exclusivity is what it's all about. And a lot of the architecture architecture is still the same architecture it was, architecture was built with. Uh, a lot of, some of the antiques are still there. Some of the, a lot of all the fireplaces, the the peacock dome, which is two thousand five hundred pieces of stained glass, is in the peacock bar. Um, it's just a a, a fabulous uh, exotic place. The thing about it is when you drive into Big Brion Sea and you come you, you come over the crown of the hill for the first time and you see the island floating in what is the Atlantic, 500 yards off the coast of Devon, you can't help but smile. 
It is just the most electric place. And when you get there, you feel as though all your woes and concerns of life dissipate through your body. There are no televisions in the bedrooms, for instance. Almost every suite is an original Art Deco bathroom suite. Um, there's, I have to also say that the, the, the Wi-Fi is a bit poor as well. But that's what it's about. It is about walking. It is about relaxing. It's about reading a book. It's reconnecting with your loved one without any external influences. And my favourite time, and it doesn't matter whether it's sunny when it feels like south of France, frankly, or whether the wind is blowing and the multitudinous seas are raging around the island, you just feel the sense of security. And you don't know how, what that really means until you've been there. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. I have a lot of soul, this place. It does, it does. So a lot of soul, and that's the, it apparently is on the same ley line, and uh, this is not a fact that I'm putting my name to, but I've been told. It's on the same li- ley line as Mont Saint-Michel, St. Michael's Mount, uh, us, which used to be called St. Michael's Island, uh, and St. Michael's Chapel on the Isle of Wight. Uh, and I, I have been told that people can feel, we have a, a, a lagoon that we've enclosed. Uh, I've been told that, that for those who feel these things, there's a huge sense of power down in the mermaid pool. Mm-hmm. But you have to go and experience that for yourself. The other thing about Burr that's very special in terms of its connection with history is we have two restaurants in the hotel. We have the ballroom, which is the ballroom, and we have the Netfold, named after Archie, but the ballroom is black tie only. You have to wear black or white tie or regimental attire. A tiara is not overdressed. Mm. Uh, and I think it's one of the few places left, certainly in England, the UK, maybe in the world, where you have to you have to dress up uh, in black tie or white tie. The the other restaurant, the Netherfold, is more casual and it's open neck dining. Uh, you don't need a tie at all. Uh, but you do need to be smart. So it is uh, it, it, it's special in a million different ways, including how you dine. And there's live music every night. Wow. Okay. Like a ball. And the truth about staying at the hotel, I always find it becomes like a house party because it's not a big hotel. There are 25 suites. It becomes like a house party. You turn around and you end up talking to some very interesting person uh, about a million different subjects. And, you know, creating a place and maintaining that, you talked about in the beginning as well, that you get your staff locally. But how do you then create, you know, you said that you, the stuff that could be done, you translated what you've learned about culture from your other businesses. How do you build that culture? Because it needs culture to create an experience like you just described. Just, just a slight correction. We keep our staff local. A lot of them are from uh, Europe still. Hmm. Uh, in fact, if I'm, a lot of the foundation of our staff have been there so long that they are from uh, Middle Europe, as indeed my father was, interestingly, hmm. from Czechoslovakia. And um, so we keep them local to save the trouble. But in terms of finding people locally, it's very difficult because there's no one lives in South Ham's hardly. Certainly not enough people who would, we can employ to run a hotel. We have about 60-odd people working in a hotel. Hmm. Um, and so your other question was how... Do you then create this? The know, ambience, uh, the culture. The culture the, it, it's very different. And if I'm truthful, um, the great thing about our London business is my sister and I started it. Uh, I was its first employee. Uh, and then we we grew it granularly to where we are now. And that is much easier to put your ethos into the company by choosing the right people from day one. And what we found was the people who don't fit that culture don't stay very long. Occasionally you get it wrong, you employ someone, you think they have the right culture, they don't, they leave. But um, that's that's quite straightforward. But to buy a business, a hotel, that has been going for a long time where there hasn't, well, the culture is not yours for a start, where perhaps the culture isn't the culture that you would choose, to change that culture has probably been one of the most difficult things in business that I've had to do and we're about there and the other thing that makes it particularly difficult of course you have a transigent workforce who just come in the summer because we have many more people on the beach who want serving drinks from the pub so you have this workforce who uh, aren't there all the time you don't have time to get your ethos and culture into them so you need to make sure that your your main 
bearers of your culture, your, your senior staff, are totally bought in. And we're about this. The truth is, we're about there. We're not, we haven't finished. Uh, everyone knows what it is we want to achieve. Everyone agrees with what it is we want to achieve. But the understanding of what it is we want to achieve uh, is not uh, spread thoroughly throughout the business yet. And I think that's that's quite normal because I have interviewed a number of business owners here, about 200 here on the show. And many of them, when we talk about culture, they talk about is this, you know, it's a life work. You work on the culture every day, 1% every day. And to get, you know, first of all, the alignment, and then we have the alignment. And then what's really happened, the beliefs and behaviors that happens needs some time and it needs some hard work. It's a Hercules task they talk about, many of them. Oh, I like that. The most important thing uh, is that the head of the business, and unfortunately that isn't me, I'm not there every day, the head of the business needs to carry, needs to be that culture. So I believe we have we have someone uh, who runs a hotel in Penny Brown who believes what we believe as a family, believes in integrity and honesty and hard work, uh, and looking after people and family values in essence. And uh, with them in place on the island full time, that does percolate down. But if you don't have that, you'll never succeed. Um, and it becomes kind of interesting again, because if you don't have the culture, you also can't make the impact you want to do through business. I guess you, have, you need to build the culture to make you know business results, but also the impact you want to do on the planet and the message. And one of the things I was thinking as I were preparing for this is like, you know, is a, what, what can hospitality actually do about this, you know, uh, green movement and how do we actually participate in it as business owners and actually trying to change the world to possible? Because I'm sure a lot of business people, I know that they want to do something either with the food system or they want to do net zero or, but again, like, what can I really do? And does it really matter? Should hospitality play a big role? Well, I think I wouldn't, carve out hospitality i know we're about hospitality in this podcast i wouldn't carve it out i i wouldn't i'd i'd amalgamate into all industry needs to play its part i don't necessarily see what i mean hospitality is has in many ways an easier solution buying its uh its produce locally um being able, having its own land to put uh photoelectric cells on uh keeping its staff like it, it, it hospitality in many ways, has it easier than other industries. But I don't see why it on its own, or, or in any way differently, I should say, uh, should uh, should feel as though it is it is holding a banner with everyone else to follow. Uh, certainly, I don't feel a difference in our London business. Uh, and we haven't talked about it, but I have a drinks business called Gunner. Uh, um, and I don't, we, we look at that in exactly the same way. I don't think any one of my businesses should... Um, feel as though it's carrying the banner they all need to be carrying the banner and if we take that and say you know all business leaders we we have to do downstream upstream in our supply chains whatever we can do to you know in if maybe it's not that what's going to change the world but maybe it's going to influence the people that can government so on change the world what what is like the most pressing issue you would like to be solved or believe needs to be solved first? Uh, well, I think uh, in Britain, mm. uh, it's having a sustainable power electricity production plan. Um, speak to Doug King about this. He'll tell you that the plan we have is not sufficient and not sustainable. So that would be the most, that is the most pressing. I, I just want to uh, just reverse a little bit and talk about the changes because yes, the big changes uh, I believe are out there, turn the lights off. But I think that there was a, a lovely story, uh, I think it was the 2012 Olympics, about the British biking uh, trainer. And he tried, he didn't want to change anything 100%. He changed 100 things 1%. And I think mm. probably most of listeners have heard that story. But that 1% change in everything ended up to 100% change. And of course, they won all those medals, didn't they? They were yeah. absolutely fascinating. And 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 I feel I think Clive Woodward um, had the same philosophy when he took England to the World Cup and won the Rugby World Cup. So there are things today, you know, get on a bike rather than in your car, walk 
um, rather than take a tube, turn a light off when you leave the room. I mean, there are obviously tiny, tiny things that if we all did every day would make a big difference. The issue, I think, and why a lot of people don't do them is it's not an obvious change. So you go, well, if I don't turn the light off, no one else turns the light off. What difference? What impact am I making? So uh, I think that's an education part, and that's part of what this podcast is about and getting that message out there is making people think about it. And if we can make people take responsibility in a very small way for all the tiny little bits and pieces. Yeah, it's super interesting. Uh, just a little experiment with the 1% over the weekend here. My son started his school holiday and we normally go for a walk. And then they'd had something with the climate up in the last couple of years, especially about rubbish in in the streets or in the countryside. And we live by the countryside in Sussex and near Brighton. And then we went out for a trip in the Downs and I said, so uh, we're gonna go on the trip this morning. We're gonna take a bag. Yeah, we need we need we need gloves, Dad. We need some of these food gloves you have and some bags. Said, oh wow, well, yeah, we're gonna be picking up rubbish. He said, so he's seven years old. And he needs to understand that something needs to happen. And he picked up like three shopping bags of rubbish, and he was so proud, like taking pictures of it and that like a seven year old to understand that this needs to change. But it's also scary. We picked up in an hour three bags of rubbish. I, Michael, I love that story and I have one right back at you if mm. that's all right. Mm. Um, just, well, before lockdown, um, uh, 19 of us, children, adults, hired two boats in Greece, sailing boats, you'll be glad to hear, and we sailed around the islands and we got to an island, a bay, no one else was there, we dropped our anchor, we were going to stay there the night and my friend Stephen Taylor said, everyone grab a bag and... Uh, we looked at the, the floor of the of the bay and it was covered in wet wipes and rubbish and detritus, as well as the beach. And he, I don't know how he got us to do it, but he did. So every, all 19 of us collected rubbish and we collected so many sacks, which we then took to the next port or harbour that we went to. It was absolutely disgusting, but we didn't scratch the surface. How sad is that? Mm. Yeah, and that's 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 the thing. Even those two stories are, you know, together they are maybe one percent or two percent. <laughs> uh, if they are a percent, but again, but if, if everybody was doing it every day, mm-hmm. we will get mm-hmm. to maybe a, a very good place. Before we we end, I have a couple more questions. I wanted to hear because you mentioned, you know, the pandemic. You know, all leaders and humans has gone through some really really crazy years and. There's probably more craziness coming as the world always are throwing challenges. But, but what 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 have you been your most significant learning the last two years as a business owner, a multiple business owner? Um, I think the most important part is to talk. Mm. You must talk. You must understand in your business, uh, which again I think became very apparent, although I'm going to claim that we did know it, but it became very apparent that all stakeholders are important and one of your biggest stakeholders uh, obviously the money and obviously your clients but it's your staff Mm. your staff where it begins and where it ends for us true who was it um was it richard branson or some um pillar of society who said treat your staff as you like them to treat your clients and that has to be that has to be true uh in the hotel we allow them all to live in the hotel uh, in these beautiful suites rather than in their staff accommodation, where they were secure and they were happy and they were, uh, there was heat, there was light, and they had lovely bathrooms to wash in. So um, look after your staff. And in our, in our business up in London, we had regular get-togethers. Uh, we uh, had re- regular mentoring sessions. Uh, we talked about the issues. Um, we were understanding of the issues, but we were very positive. We didn't believe it was forever. It'll, it's going to go away, and uh, we kept we kept our staff busy with learning and interaction. Mm. So, um, so in terms of learned, I'm going to say probably knew it, but it absolutely sharpened the pencil. Funny analogy uh, was uh, is look after your most important stakeholder, which is your staff. Yeah, and keep on communicating good or bad news. Everything. Yeah. Um what about yourself? Like you have multiple businesses. How do you keep yourself in, you know, so you make sure you can make a positive impact every day? And how do you make, you know, yourself sharp, 
show up strong because everybody looks at the founder, the business owner. For no, so, true. so you, I'm going to tell a bad secret. Mm. Uh, um, or, or my friends know this about me, that if I'm not feeling good, I don't go out. <laughs> ah, you stay away. <laughs> I stay away. Uh, and my, I, uh, my friends on occasion through my life, they might go, yeah, you're not feeling, you're not feeling great. What, do you want to talk about it? And we talk because they haven't heard from me. So uh, that's a bit of a, a secret. I don't think I've ever said that, actually. Um, so uh, when I go out, I'm being positive. Um, how do I remain positive? I find time. Um, I find it doesn't matter where it is, whether it's in your bed at night, in your bed in the morning, on the train, into work, um, walking the dog. Take time to think through all of your impacts and your uh, your impacts of meeting people uh, in your business, how you talk, what happened yesterday, how how was your how were your interactions yesterday? Could you have made them better? So I'm going to say just succinctly, finding time for yourself to think about your behaviour yesterday, your behaviour today, and your behaviour tomorrow. It's really interesting. It's like solitude, stillness is key for you to have this moment of stillness yeah. Yeah. to reflect absolutely about what went well what could be better really interesting thank you thank you for that Giles I think that's a really really helpful advice because lots of us are just busy doing instead of being and that you need to take that time to be in principle that's what you're saying what would be your um, like top advice to um, other business leaders out there that, that want to make you know not just a good business but also want to make impact uh, very question. Of course, through the the podcast, we've talked about a lot of what might be the advice. Uh, but if I'm going to start right at the beginning, uh, and it was once said to me, is don't try and hatch a china egg, <laughs> which I think you can pretty well work out what that means. But um, we talked before the podcast about what being an entrepreneur was, mm. and it's a bring together of the idea, the money, and the bringing to marketing market successfully unfortunately if you start with the idea and it's no good and you sit on it hoping it's going to hatch you spend five years doing very little and learning nothing so if i was give one piece of advice make sure that your egg is not a china one that's a very good one get it uh, get it out there get it tested reiterate if necessary and also leave it if it doesn't work be brave be brave yeah um where can people find you and connect with the, the hotel if they want to know more what what are the best places to go uh well, if you put burr island hotel you'll find me put giles hooks you'll probably find me um mm -hmm. always being told by my uh, credit rating agency that your details are out there mm -hmm. so <laughs> um um sapience my pr company uh will always be able to get hold of me but if you put office space in town there's contact page um i'm easily found and available Great, great. Thank you so much for, for taking the time, Giles, uh, and coming talking about your, your big vision for the future for hospitality, but also for the UK as a nation. Thank you, Mario. It's been an absolute pleasure. Amazing, Giles. Thank you for your great advice and insights on how to build a better world through business. Now ask yourself, are you as a leader using your business to make the world a better place? And if you're interested in finding out how and get inspired to build a business for good, tune in to episode number 160 with Paul Hargroves, founder and CEO of Cost Welfare on B Corps on being a force for good. I really appreciate that you're listening in. So if you enjoyed today's conversation, please share, rate, review, or subscribe to one of our channels, which all can be done via the website hospitalitymavericks.com. A big thank you to Biz Simply for supporting us, bringing great insights, strategies, and tools to help leaders become better every day. Check them out at bizsimply.com or via their social at bizsimply or bizsimplyhq. You can also email them directly at podcast at bizsimply.com. A big thank you to Fina Charlton, who's the show producer and editor for the Podcast Collective. If you have any ideas and feedback for the show or thoughts, reach out to me via LinkedIn or my email, michael at hospitalitymavericks.com. Tune in next time for another interview. And in the meantime, find out more about us, subscribe to the weekly newsletter Maverick Talk via hospitalitymavericks.com. 
I'm Michael Tingser, and you've been listening to the Hospitality Maverick Podcast Show. Be Maverick. <laughs>